um, and we'll share it on our social media pages um, at a later date. Um, everyone is on mute except for the speaker, and I've also disabled video. If you want to ask a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. I'll collect them and then at the end of the presentation, share them with our speaker who will answer them in turn. If you get kicked off the call, simply click the original link in your email. Uh, when the program is over, I'll stay around to monitor the chat, chat comments. Um, if you have suggestions for ways we can improve our virtual programs, please pass them along then. You may have heard Dr. David Hamer on WBUR, I know I have, um, being interviewed about the pandemic. He's an infectious disease specialist and professor of global health and medicine at the BU School of Public Health and School of Medicine. We are thrilled to be hosting him here tonight in this forum. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Hamer. And I will do the applause. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Hamer. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for letting me join you. I'm going to switch to screen share here. And um, so you should be able to see um, my slides. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and sort of where we are and what's next. This is an outline of my, of my presentation. I'm going to talk about epidemiology, including what we know about transmission of this virus, um, and clinical aspects, treatment, and prevention, and a little bit looking ahead to, to what, what's going to happen in the sort of near term and maybe medium to long term in terms of the virus evolution and, and epidemiology. Um, just a, a point of clarification, and that is the um, SARS-CoV-2 is the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, um, is the virus that causes the disease called COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 is used often almost interchangeably um, in referring to the virus, but technically that's the disease caused by the virus. So coronaviruses are a large family of viruses um, that uh, can infect many different species of anim animals from mammals to birds to bats. There are four major genera um, and uh, there are four human coronaviruses that, that have been known to cause respiratory tract infections, primarily upper respiratory tract infections, similar to the common cold and influenza-like illness. Um, and these have been recognized since the 60s, and they cause cyclical outbreaks, usually in the winter months, every two or three years. And uh, the in, in 2002, late 2002, uh, in Guangdong, China, there, a, an outbreak of an unusual pneumonia was identified. This spread to Hong Kong, and from Hong Kong spread to Toronto, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, Vietnam, and, and a few other places. And that was eventually identified as a novel virus that's known as SARS, the, this, this severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. That eventually was controlled um, after about 8,000 people were infected, and, 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 but a pretty high case fatality rate with uh, nearly 9% of those people dying from, from SARS-CoV. Um, but it never reappeared. There's not been a case since other than one case in a uh, laboratory worker who had a needle stick, accidental exposure. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus was identified around 2012 to 2013. This has continued to cause a sort of a smoldering outbreak in the Middle East primarily with some exportation. There's actually a, a, a number of cases due to somebody who arrived in South Korea and went from hospital to hospital and transmitted it to literally hundreds of people um, in a short course of time. Um, but beyond that, it really hasn't spread much outside of the Middle East. Um, and this, this, but this also has a pretty high case fatality rate. So one question that's arisen is where did this new coronavirus come from? And there, we, we now have the facility to do rapid whole genome sequencing 
of viruses um, that in, in ways that we really couldn't do even five or 10 years ago. And so these have been become much more commonly used tools to track uh, both to identify novel viruses, but also to, to track their evolution. Um, this, this has fairly close homology to bat coronaviruses. And there's a, a coronavirus that was 96% identical to the Wuhan coronavirus was found in a horseshoe bat in, in Yunnan, in a cave in Yunnan province in China. There, there's also a very close re genetic relation between this virus and, and a coronavirus found in pangolins. And that's a picture on the right of a pangolin, which is a, a reptilian creature um, found in China and that sometime is, is used, uh, is, is consumed for food. Um, the, uh, so this is sort of the current status of, of where we are with this outbreak. And so this started in China. And if you look down at sort of the bottom here, January and February, most of the cases were in the Western Pacific uh, World Health Organization area of the world. So these were mostly in China and then somewhat neighboring countries, Singapore, South Korea, um, Thailand, and Japan. Yeah, but then it spread to Europe and it really took off in Europe. And so Europe is this sort of, uh, sort of pinkish beige color. And then it also hit um, the Americas, primarily the United States, but it's also re reached Canada. And, and really the epidemiology has changed. China is down to essentially zero cases at this point in time, if we can believe the Chinese CDC data. And in contrast, the U.S. leads the world with about a third of the, the well, nearly, uh, well, we're pushing 4 million cases now. I, I read today that we're up to 3.8 million cases worldwide. And there have been over 250,000 deaths. And, and uh, so this has really been massive. And, and the U.S. has the greatest number of cases after Spain, or followed by Spain, Italy, the United Kingdom, and Russia. And Russia is sort of a late comer to this. They didn't have very few cases initially, but in the last couple of weeks, it's really moved quickly in Russia. This is a map also from the World Health Organization. They put out a daily situational report on COVID-19. And this shows the number of confirmed cases reported in the last seven days by country, territory, or area of the world. And the darker colors are, are much higher numbers of cases. But you can see that the United States leads the world, unfortunately, in this respect. But, but there are a number of other concerning uh, places. So Russia um, has, has become, uh, has a lot of transmission. India, very large, densely populated country. Brazil, and actually I was on the phone with a colleague in, uh, actually on a Zoom call with a colleague in Peru, and they've had 55,000 cases there. And that's a pretty small country, but, but it's moved very quickly there. This shows the situation in the U.S. This is a map from the U.S. CDC and the dark purple colored states are those that have had um, 20, 20 to 25,000 or more. And you can see that New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania um, are, are up there along with Illinois, uh, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and California. And you know, I think that, that at least the last I saw, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts were the top three states in the country for cases. But this may change over the next month. This, these are data from the uh, COVID-19 dashboard from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. This is from uh, yesterday. And so they, there were 1,700 new cases, total of 72,000 confirmed cases, 208 deaths that day. More than 4,000 deaths were probably up to 4,500 or higher at this point in time. And, and you can see the percent of all cases currently hospitalized is only 5%. Um, you know, milder cases do not need hospitalization, um, but ideally they should be isolated to prevent continued transmission. This is a, a breakdown, <coughs> excuse me, of the state by county. And you can see that Suffolk County um, has, has been hardest hit, but, but there are a number of other parts of the state um, that have a uh, pretty substantial burden of cases as well. So how is SARS-CoV-2 transmitted? Um, so initially, the, when, when this outbreak started, it started in the Huanan seafood market in, uh, in 
Wuhan, China. And this is not just a seafood market, it's, it's a wet market. So it's a market where they sell live animals. And officially, there were no pangolins being sold there, but unofficially, there are a lot of animals sold that are not registered because there's, there's often I illegal trade in some of these animal species. Um, in any case, uh, initially it started there and it seemed to be people that had contact with the market were infected. It took a little while to realize that this could be transmitted person to person. And, and there are a couple of nice elegant studies done by uh, colleagues of mine at Hong Kong University um, to show that the you know, intrafamilial transmission. Um, but with time, we started to recognize that <clears throat> this could be transmitted by not just respiratory droplet, somebody coughing or sneezing, but by a, more of a fine particle aerosol. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that this 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 aerosol, um, even people breathing or singing, um, could exhale virus um, laden particles, and that being in close contact with somebody that you could inhale it and become infected. It's also possible to have a direct contact either with an infected person or contaminated surfaces and become infected. And then uh, about three to 5% of people with SARS-CoV-2 or with COVID-19, the disease, um, will have gastrointestinal symptoms, the abdominal pain and diarrhea. The virus can be identified in stool and it actually can be grown from stool. So there's a theoretical risk of, of fecal oral transmission, although this has not been clearly documented. And then zoonotic, I mean, this, this came from animal sources, but the, one of the questions has been, you know, can, can household pets become infected, for example? And there's not good evidence in that. There have been a few uh, well-described dogs that have been infected, but they had a very low grade infection. And it, it seemed like they were infected from people and they, they were not likely to transmit it to other people. Um, some large cats in zoos, tigers in particular, have been infected. So there, there, there's, you know, theoretically it's possible, but, but I don't think there's, there's a great risk from that. So the, the, the rest of this is really on, on the sort of facility of transmission of this virus. <clears throat> and one way that we look at this as medical epidemiologists is, is considering the basic reproductive number. So this is the average number of people infected by one infected person. So, so basically for this virus, the estimate is um, two to three people are infected by each infected person. Now this is in the absence of control measures, <coughs> excuse me. And, and sort of shelter at home, social distancing, all the things that we've been doing in Massachusetts over the last you know, four to six weeks or so are designed to try and bring that reproductive number down to less than one. If you can get it down less than one, then um, onward spread in the community usually stops on its own. Uh, this, this is a little bit complicated, but this, this, I want to sort of highlight why this virus is so challenging. Um, the upper part of the curve, you see the SARS, the original SARS coronavirus. And basically you incubate for about five days on average, and then you develop a clinical illness. You, it's not until symptoms develop that, that a person's infectious and can transmit the virus. In contrast to that, what we've learned about SARS-CoV-2 is that you incubate, become clinically ill, but the infectious period may start before clinical symptoms develop. And some people may be asymptomatic and never even develop symptoms, and yet they can transmit the virus. And in this, this pre-symptomatic phase and early in the clinical illness, there are very high concentrations of virus being excreted you know, from the upper airway by infected people. This is a little bit of complicated data looking at the uh, survival of, of this virus in the environment. And basically they inoculated, um, this is an aerosol study, copper cardboard, they inoculated it with various concentrations of virus and then followed it over time. And, and they showed with, with aerosol, um, it sort of even at three hours, you could still detect viable virus in the air. Um, turns out with um, copper, um, it is, has antimicrobial activities, and so it doesn't survive very well on a copper surface. And fortunately, it also doesn't survive that well on cardboard and paper. You know, about eight hours, but by, by 24 hours, you still may be, be able to detect it, but very low 
concentrations of the virus that may not be sufficient to cause a human infection. And um, the, the challenges though are stainless steel where sort of the half-life is more like 24 hours or plastic where it's more like 48 hours. So it can survive for longer on stainless steel and plastic. Um, and this is just a summary of that. So aerosol is viable for three hours, but the, the tighter of uh, the concentration of virus decreased over that time. I can survive longer on plastic and stainless steel, less, less stable on copper and cardboard. Fortunately, it turns out that temperature and relative humidity are very important. Um, and, and there's clear evidence that, that more virus is inactivated at higher temperatures. So 40, is, 40 Celsius is pretty hot. I mean, that's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, and, but, but clearly this has implications for summer months because if, if, if it's hotter outside and the virus survives less well, there may be less transmission. And relative humidity is a complicated story. It turns out either very low or fairly high relative humidity support the virus. Um, whereas sort of something in, 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 in the intermediate level is less um, good for virus survival. So I'm gonna shift and talk a little bit about clinical manifestations. So, so this, this is a really a range of illness ranging from completely asymptomatic to uh, mild illness to severe life-threatening pneumonia and, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. The, the mild in illness can be characterized by typical upper respiratory tract infection symptoms, a sore throat, uh, runny nose, uh, dry cough, um, you know, maybe low-grade fever, uh, chills, muscle aches, headaches, um, and but notably, one one two notable symptoms that have have been identified are loss of sense of smell and loss of taste. And some people may present with those symptoms alone before other symptoms develop. Um, it's not specific for this disease because it can be seen with, with other viral respiratory tract infections, but it's, it's definitely been a notable finding. Um, and there are a number of other uh, sort of unusual complications that have been described recently. I'll comment on those in a minute. The, the disease may progr progress to pneumonia with, without, uh, you know, not very severe pneumonia, at least not requiring oxygen support, but then in a subset, and this varies, you know, can be as many as 10% as of hospitalized patients or even 15% will develop severe pneumonia where they have very low concentrations of oxygen and require um, oxygen support. And then a, a subset of those will go on to develop acute respiratory distress syndrome with a, even with a septic-like picture and require intensive care unit support. Um, there are a number of rare manifestations that have been described and we're learning more about those. Some patients may present with a rash, sometimes with conjunctivitis, with redness of the eyes. And then in the news in the last few days is a, a inflammatory syndrome that's been seen in children that's very similar to a disease called Kawasaki syndrome um, that appears to be associated with this. And the other unusual one is clotting. There, there's evidence that this may increase the risk of clot formation, um, either deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or even stroke. Um, so very worrisome finding um, that, that we, we've learned about um, at Boston Medical Center and they've actually instituted anticoagulation prophylaxis interventions in all hospitalized patients to try and prevent these complications. So this is a complicated figure, but basically I think I ran through a lot of the, the symptoms on, on, the, on the, the left hand side. Uh, I guess a little new vocabulary for those who have not seen it, but agurzia is loss of taste and anosmia is loss of smell. Um, and there are, so I've mentioned that you can have respiratory symptoms, less commonly gastrointestinal symptoms, and a num number of other systemic symptoms. Uh, chest x-rays may show a number of different findings. And a, one notable issue with this is that the total white blood cell count may be normal or low, but lymphocytes in particular, a subset of white blood cells are often low. And then inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, CRP, are often elevated. This is, this is very complicated. I just want to give you an idea that, that, that some people, um, some patients will have mild illness and stay mild, but others will progress from an early milder illness 
to develop um, shortness of breath uh, and, and then uh, a very intense inflammatory response. It's really the, your, the individual's immune response um, that, that leads to a lot of the damage. And, and that, that's what can be really dangerous and, and can be life-threatening. Um, so the, a little bit about risk factors for severe disease uh, and, and death here. This is a large case study that came out uh, from China fairly early on in the epidemic. And a few notable things here, age is, is associated with older age, is associated with the risk of, of uh, severe disease and death. And you can see based on the graph, and really over the age of 60, the risk starts to increase. It's higher in those over 70, and it's very high in 80 or 90 year olds. Um, other risk factors, underlying medical conditions, uh, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, hypertension, um, cancer has been shown in, in some series. And in the United States, we've learned that obesity greatly increases risk. Um, and healthcare workers are at risk just through as an occupational hazard, but this is, this is a big deal. I mean, we've, we've had literally nearly 300 healthcare workers infected at Boston Medical Center, despite major efforts to try and make sure everybody had adequate protective, personal protective equipment. So this is a very easily spread virus. And I think I'll move ahead. Um, this, these are data from the US. This is sort of an early summary from the morbidity mortality weekly report. And it breaks uh, individuals down into those who are not hospitalized, hospitalized, not in the ICU and ICU admission. I think the normal thing here is that uh, those who end up in the hospital or in the ICU have a much greater likelihood to have at least one underlying medical condition and sometimes more than one. This is a uh, graph from The Economist from just a couple days ago. And I put this in just to show that, that we are seeing a lot of excess mortality. I mean, many deaths way above normal for this time of year uh, that, that are attributable to COVID-19. In fact, globally, the, the number of deaths per week has reached such a high level that it's past road injuries, cancer, and it's second only to pulmonary disease. So how is the diagnosis made? So, so the mainstay of diagnosis is doing a direct detection of the virus using real-time polymerase chain reaction, basically identifying RNA of the virus in, in samples. The best samples have been um, nasopharyngeal swab samples, so basically uh, deep in the, na in, the nas in the nose, in the nasal mucosa. Uh, initial studies suggested that if you took an oral swab, it wasn't quite as good at making the diagnosis, but there have been more recent studies suggesting that either an oral swab or uh, saliva may be just as good as a nasal swab. And we need a little more evidence to support that, but if, if that, works out, it'll be a lot easier for sample collection because the nasal swab is both a little bit tricky to perform and it's uncomfortable for individuals who are having it done. Um, you could also make a diagnosis based on a, a sputum or, or other deep lung specimens. Um, and, and for re routine diagnostic testing, this, this can be done in a biosafety level two lab, which most hospitals have. But if, if you need to, if you're interested in culturing this virus, you have to work in a much more restricted biosafety level three laboratory. And um, so I'm going to say a little bit more about serologic tests next. So I already mentioned PCR testing, so I'll, I'll pass that. So a lot of interest in antibody testing. The problem, well, there's a number of problems and I'll go through those. One is there are more than 100 companies that have submitted um, antibody test um, sort of prototypes to the FDA. A lot of those are not very good quality. A lot of them have very little substantiating data provided with them. So the FDA is trying to crack down on this. Um, and, and there's some that look pretty good, uh, I think, um, Roche, Abbott, and then Ortho Diagnostics all look like they have very good tests. Um, but, but the challenge is interpreting these. Many of them test for immunoglobulin G, IgG. This tends to come up in response to a new infection after about two weeks, about 14 days, and, and then persists usually for years. 
But in this case, it, it, in some diseases, having a, a certain concentration of IgG is equivalent to being protected against that disease, sometimes for a very long term. Um, but, but for other diseases, that IgG may not be strong enough to really mean that you're fully protected uh, for the long run. So there's been a lot of discussion, you know, can we have immunity passports? Can we use this as a way to say, oh, we don't need to worry about this person, they've already had it. And, and the answer, unfortunately, is no, at least not yet. Um, it, it, partly because we, we, it's not clear that having antibody means that you're fully protected against reinfection. You might be, but, but we don't know for how long. The second is that there's a risk for cross reactions. You know, I mentioned at the beginning that there are four seasonal coronaviruses and, and some of these tests cross react with that. So if you've had those in the past, you could have a positive test and be falsely reassured uh, when, when you actually are not immune to COVID-19. So the next couple of slides are on prevention and control measures. Um, there are, you know, obviously you've probably all seen a lot of this, you know, both in the news and in and, and, and social media and so forth, but frequent hand washing is really important. Avoiding touching your eyes, nose and mouth, practicing respiratory hygiene. So either covering one's mouth and nose with a, a tissue when coughing or sneezing or with a uh, the, the corner of your shirt. Um, and maintaining social distancing is important, you know, at least six feet or two meters um, to try and minimize spread through aerosol and, and respiratory droplet. Uh, cleaning surfaces that are frequently contacted uh, with, with effective disinfectants is very important because the, the, we, you know, because of the duration that these, this virus can survive on surfaces, you know, especially plastic and stainless steel and then wearing masks. And we can, we can talk more about that in the question and answer period if necessary. Um, this is actually a nice cartoon that somebody made in, in terms of hand washing. It's really important to, to wash frequently, but ideally to wash for about 20 seconds. And uh, soap and water is good, but hand sanitizer, if it has at least a 60% ethanol or isopropanol concentration is, is, is equally good. Um, it's important to wash both sides of the hands, under the nails, between your fingers, and then to dry completely. And then in terms of when to do it, there, there's a number of options, but, but basically when entering a new building, um, when returning home after being outside, I, I tend to do it before I go into a supermarket, but then after I leave the store also, immediately after leaving, in case I've contacted something that could be contaminated. Um, and then obviously, you know, after using the bathroom, after sneezing or coughing, and then we don't really have a lot of public transportation open right now, but when things do gradually um, pick up in terms of their use, you know, I think you have to assume that anywhere you're out in public that surfaces are contaminated, you need to wash your hands after contaminating, after touching surfaces that are public services. A little bit on treatment and prevention. The, there are a lot of different treatments that have been evaluated. Uh, remdesivir has been in the news in a big way in the last week, uh, based on some data that were released by Tony Fauci and, and uh, the NIH. And the, the issue there is um, that there have been some previous studies suggesting maybe that this would work, but this is one of the first studies that suggests that it, it, it's helpful in decreasing the duration of hospitalization in patients with more severe disease. And they, they showed a decrease from 15 to 11 days. So this is good, it's not, it's not amazing, it's not a cure-all, but it definitely is good um, as an option and it's, it's, it's being rolled out for emergency use in, in many parts of the country. The problem is that Gilead who produces this is really struggling to make enough and there still are controlled trials going on. And I think those are gonna be important, especially to see if this helps in patients with mild to moderate disease and helps them prevent developing severe disease because it makes sense to, to treat early rather than wait until somebody is severely ill. Hydroxychloroquine and then chloroquine, an old malarial drug, have also been in the news quite a bit. Um, they, um, there was some initial suggestion that they worked based on a study from France study had a lot of major flaws with it. Since then, there have been a number of studies that come out suggesting this, this does not work. 
very well, if at all, for, for treatment of COVID-19. There are a lot of other drugs being tested. Um, some of these are biologics that work against the inflammatory pathways that, that, that may help sort of prevent someone from going from being moderately ill to being deathly ill. Um, and some of them work in particular against uh, interleukin-6, and, and we've had some great success with that at Boston Medical Center. There's a lot of work on developing vaccines. There are a few companies that are really moving quickly, um, but I think that uh, an effective vaccine is going to take some time. I mean, there, there are suggestions it could be as early as this fall. I think, honestly, it's more likely to be 2021. Uh, I spoke to somebody at Sanofi Pasteur, a vaccine ma manufacturer today, and he said, really, realistically, it's more like 2022. Um, and then there are a lot of public health interventions that are being developed in, in, in the news recently in Massachusetts is contact tracing as an option for trying to identify um, if so many infected individuals identify to figure out who they've been in touch with so those people can be contacted and then you know, suggest they go into quarantine or if they develop symptoms, be tested to see if they're infected. So last slide or two, um, this is one that summarizes why COVID-19 is so serious. Um, the case fatality rate is relatively high. It's nearly as high as the Spanish flu that caused the massive uh, global pandemic in 1918 a little bit higher than some of the other pandemic influenza outbreaks, not quite as bad as SARS or MERS, uh, but the number of cases has is, is really been quite high. Um, and, and the, um, the r not the reproductive number, the number of infected people that can arise from each infected person is, 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 is fairly high with this, and that means it's very easily transmissible. Um, and this is another comparison. This is looking at SARS-CoV-2 versus two other SARS versus two other coronaviruses, and then the pandemic influenza H1N1 that hit the world in 2009. And you can see at this point we have, you know, I'd say nearly four million cases. Uh, case fatality rate has really been hard to define. It, I've seen anything from less than one to high as, as high as four or five percent. I think it really depends on the population and how many milder cases are mixed in with the denominator. Uh, it's not as high, fortunately, as the original SARS coronavirus or the MERS coronavirus, um, but still substantial. And I think that we're, we're going to see much higher uh, numbers of deaths globally over the next six months to a year. And finally, this is, uh, again, another uh, picture. The Massachusetts High Technology Council has this great briefing that's really trying to look at sort of where we are, what may happen, and, and, and what, what the implications are for businesses in Massachusetts. So, so if you look at the unmitigated spread, you can have as many as 30 to 40,000 cases per day um, with, with effective control measures, you know, sort of shelter at home, um, people not working at, you know, people working from home, schools closed, there can be a drop off in cases. Uh, but, but if we relax too much, and, and don't and let our guard down, there could be a second wave in the fall. Um, and, and that could lead to, to a lot of problems and the need for another lockdown. And again, you know, the, the, until we have an effective safe vaccine, uh, we're gonna need to be really attentive to these um, public health measures and, and personal protective measures. So stop there. Um, two photos that I took earlier this year when travel was still an option. Um, one of them on the left is um, actually fever screening and symptom-based screening on entry into Zambia. I, I went to Zambia in early February for, for some projects that I have there. And on the right is a picture from a, a local airline in Japan. I was there in late January, well, sort of mid to late January as the coronavirus outbreak was starting to take off. Um, and by the time we left, people were wearing masks everywhere, especially in, in public places like airports. So I will, oh, sorry, just one more here. Coronavirus, this is, you may have seen this, but if not, it's not a beer. Here on the left, Corona Beer changes their name to avoid association with the coronavirus outbreak. Maybe not the best name, Ebola Extra. Um, and then here's another view. Of, coronavirus or coronavirus versus the world. So I'll stop there and um, be happy to take questions.
So how do we do for time? That's about half an hour. Yeah. Excellent. Yep, you did a great job. Um, right on schedule. Thank you so much for all of that background information. It kind of um, frames it all for all of us. Um, I do have a bunch of questions that people submitted beforehand. Um, so I thought I would go through those first um, and then um, do the chat questions. Um, question one, how informative is antibody testing likely to be for America? And how will serotype differences affect protection, seeing that South Korean data suggests that some individuals test negative for antibodies post-recovery, i.e. possibly losing immunity, and other recovered survivors can relapse? And I'm guessing you understand that better so, than I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, those are all good questions. So There's a couple different questions there. Um, you know, one is, uh, it relates to the immune response. And I, I think I'll comment on that first. And it is, it's complicated. And I think that we need more evidence to understand it better. Um, there, there have been uh, at least one study, maybe a couple studies that have suggested that um, so there's, there's kind of antibody called neutralizing antibodies, and these are antibodies that neutralize the virus in tissue culture. They're not so easy to test for unless you have a setup where you can grow the virus, um, but, but those are, are antibodies that, that are very protective against infection. And, and one study showed that patients that had been really ill, that had more moderate to severe disease, had very high levels of neutralizing antibodies. In contrast, those who had very mild syndromes did not. And, and the concern there is that they appear not to have mounted as strong an immune response and they may not be protected against, um, for long against future um, uh, exposure. The second, and, and some of those may be relate to the later part of the question, which is there, there's some evidence, uh, at least some case reports of people who appear to have gotten better. They had a negative nasopharyngeal swab or maybe two and then they develop recurrent symptoms a week or two later and were shown to be uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive again. And so the question of whether they relapsed, we don't know whether it was a, a reinfection, um, like a new infection or a relapse. We, we think it's relapse, but this, the, most of these, these case reports have not been published. They've been in the, the lay press and not um, published. So, so we don't, there's a lot we don't know about immunity. Um, and, and that relates to the, the final part of the question, which is, you know, how useful is antibody testing? And as of right now, we, you know, I, I'd say it's, it may not be that useful because of the concerns about the quality of the tests and what a positive antibody test means. It, if it, 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 you know, just having a positive antibody um, may mean that you're protected for some period of time, but, but it might not mean that you're protected. Um, it also could be a false positive because of cross-reaction with other uh, coronaviruses. So there's, there's a lot of challenges. It, it's, it's, I mean, it would be nice to be able to do this and say, all right, you're immune, you don't need to worry about it, but we're not there yet. Okay, great. Um, this question you probably won't be able to answer, uh, but someone wanted to know if there would be an opportunity for Waltham residents to be tested, um, you know, with the nasal swab uh, to see if they've been exposed and have antibodies. Okay, so so a couple things. One is the nasal swab doesn't detect the antibodies; it detects the virus directly, and and okay. um, and I have no idea how readily available the testing is. You know, we have had significant problems in Massachusetts and across the U.S. In, in scaling up enough tests to, to be able to test everybody who might have been exposed or who might be infected. When we've done uh, sort of spot prevalent surveys in places like uh, either nursing homes or homeless shelters, we found a lot of infected people that were asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. Some were really pre-symptomatic and went on to develop symptoms. Um, but, uh, and, and actually in our emergency room, we've taken to swabbing everyone who's being admitted to the hospital because there's such a high prevalence of, of infection in the community right now. There was a study in, in um, New York where they did that with pregnant women over a week period and found that a third of them were infected, but they had no symptoms. 
some of them went on to develop symptoms. So it would be really nice to be able to test on a much larger scale directly for the virus, um, but we just don't have enough tests yet. And I, I think that testing is, is, is gonna continue to expand um, over the next few months, and it's gonna be part of, of our return to work strategy, return to school strategy for, for some businesses and universities. Right, okay. Um, this person says, um, some communities are planning to release pu the public from quarantine. Um, and this concerns this person uh, because in Bedford, uh, they've had 133 positive cases and 12 deaths. Um, so the concern is if another town releases quarantine, won't that affect other towns? Um, and the Spanish flu came back in the fall worse than its initial outbreak. Um, and what can we do now to prevent that? Well, I think that relates to some of the, the last the last slider too I, I, I described, which is you know the risk for you know we we need to as we open businesses. I don't think schools, at least public schools, are not going to open again this year. Um, universities are being very careful and most have canceled summer classes or, or put them online I, and, and most want to reopen in the fall but I think businesses will gradually reopen in a phased manner and if we do this carefully and keep watching and testing and, and monitoring for new cases and then do augmented uh, contact tracing the state's been working on that with health from partners in health that we may be able to keep things under control but we but if not if there's a flare a sort of a sort of resurgence of disease then um there you know there, there that could happen and then we would have to sort of clamp down again in terms of some of the control measures and pull back in terms of what's open and 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 you know go back to shelter at home and so forth i mean none of us want that but but that that's all possible and i think that there needs to be sort of statewide coordination, um, you know, as well as sort of conversations between different jurisdictions within the state to, to make sure there's some harmonization of, of approach. Right. Got it. Um, this person asks, if I am quarantining at home and my family is quarantining at home, is it safe for us to visit each other? For example, um, in the case of grandchildren who want to see their grandparents who are healthy and have no risk factors. So if you have two so quarantine bubbles. The, <laughs> right, right, no, I, I, I think, sorry, my, my internet connection is a little unstable, but oh, there it goes again. So the this is um, a good question and, you know, I think, with caution, if, if, if a family has been very cautious in minimizing external contacts and being really careful when you go, you know, shopping or, or you know, out to, to public places. And so that if you have done that very carefully and the other part of the family has done the same thing, then, then at least theoretically, you should be safe at getting together. It might be wise though, if, if you're bringing really young children um, to um, a grandparent's house, say, um, to, you know, sort of, unfortunately, you know, sort of minimize contact um, to try and, you know, have some, some degree of, of spacing. Um, and, but if not, I mean, if you do have direct contact, probably, you know, masks are unfortunately probably good for the, a good idea for the time being, and then careful attention to hand washing um, in, in case somebody happens to be infected. I mean, you know, theoretically, if both families have not had any external exposure and, and have not, um, nobody's infected, then it should be safe to get together and not do any precautions. But, but I still would recommend being erring on the side of caution. Uh, this person wants to know what COVID treatments are in the pipeline so that ventilators will be needed less often. Um, 
So there are, I mean, I mentioned remdesivir. There are some other antivirals, one called Fevipiravir, that, that are being tested, um, and, and then some other adjunct therapies, and then some biologics. Um, yeah, I think over the next two to three months, we're going to have a lot more evidence coming out about which of these are effective. And, and the other thing is, is combinations of antivirals may be used, and they may be more effective than, than individual drugs. So, so I think there, right now there's really limited treatment options, but there are a lot of studies being done. And unfortunately, there are lots of patients eligible for these studies because we still have quite a few cases of this disease in, in Massachusetts. And then a related question to that is um, whether there are, whether there are affordable treatments um, in the pipeline. Like, in other words, how can we sort of control the costs associated with this? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a that's a difficult question. I mean, I, I, I think that that for remdesivir, from what I understand, Gilead has donated a large number of doses to to hospitals around the country although they, they distributed it in a, in a way that wasn't transparent and, and wasn't well balanced. So they, I think they need to work on the distribution, but that's, that's being done for free. Um, that won't last. I mean, I think that, that you know, they, they've, they're, they're a big company and they need to make a profit. I, I think the government will probably try and have some degree of control over costs to try and keep them reasonable. I, I do need to say that remdesivir is only um, available in an intravenous format, and so it would be really nice to have an oral, orally effective drug. Um, there are a few candidates, but they're, they're earlier in development. But I, I agree, you know, keeping the price reasonable is going to be very important. And, and for all my friends in, in India and Bangladesh, in those countries, it's going to be even more important to, if because they're seeing, starting to see substantial rise in cases. Um, I'm actually going to switch to the chat questions, um, which I'm assuming you can see also, but I'm happy to read them um, and then go back to the ones that I've seen um, when people lined up. Okay, so the first question yeah, is about um, COVID toes, and so this COVID is COVID toes considered. Yeah, is that is that an official symptom now? We we've read about COVID toes. So um, it's, it's, is that considered an actual symptom? almost like a sign um, in a way? Um, so you're. Internet connection was off a little. So 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 it, this is relatively new. Um, manifestation, at least recently recognized, um, that probably relates to the formation of clots and and and, and peripheral um, spreading of the clots. Um, but yeah, this is something we need to understand a little bit better in terms of how commonly it occurs. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Um, so. COVID toes are considered a related sign, but not necessarily a symptom. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so next question is about um, physical distance of six feet. Um, it seems too close given what we know about drifting floating particles. Would you recommend more distance? So this is a really good question. Um, the sort of the six foot rule or two meter rule comes from uh, past studies of uh, respiratory droplet transmission of virus, respiratory viruses, in particular influenza. So when you cough or sneeze, there are, there are large particle droplets that tend to fall to the floor, fall to the ground after about up to two meters. Um, but we now know that that even with those diseases, and definitely with with uh, COVID nineteen, that there there's also a lighter, smaller particles that that can be generated in aerosol, and those can stay in the air unless there's good um, good airflow, uh, good ventilation, and so and those can actually spread as far as eighteen twenty feet. They're probably 
diffused, like they spread out more, and probably the, the concentration is so low by the time it gets to be, you know, 10 feet or more that, that the, the risk of transmission is, is very low, if not zero. We don't really know enough about the aerodynamics of the virus, but I think that this is why masks are important um, in places where you might be in contact with somebody, and even more, you know, more than six feet away, there's still a potential risk. And I think that the, the other important part is just ventilation is important. So, you know, as, as it gets to be warmer outside, having windows open, having, you know, air circulation in, in homes where, you know, especially if some of these come in that, that might be infected, uh, this holds for stores and restaurants when they open. Um, and, and being outside is really, you know, a very safe place to be as long as you're not too close to people because just natural air currents will rapidly um, diffuse aerosols. So it's a tough question. We don't really have an answer to what, what is the optimal distance. I think, you know, the CDC and other international government authorities are sticking with the six foot, two meter rule, but I agree that this might need to be reconsidered. Hmm. Okay. Um, the next question has to do with, um, do you think the approach of broadly uh, or nationally releasing restrictions and then instituting them again and doing an on-off, you know, on-off approach or a more targeted approach of restricting only vertically in hot spots would be a better balance or some combination? Well, Tripp, that's a good question. <laughs> Tough question to me. I, I think that we, um, we're probably going to need to try very variable approaches. Um, and, and some, it may require sort of turning things on and off or sort of starting to scale up and then pulling back to some degree um, and, and doing something different. Um, just you know, the next county or the next state um, and, and trying to, if there is a hot spot, like a cluster of out, disease outbreak, then being more intense in terms of the um, public health interventions that are taking place at that. And so, so it, 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 we may be using different approaches in different places as, as this proceeds. Um, and as we learn more about what, what, what is most effective as, as, as you know, in terms of public health interventions. Uh, okay, we have a question about schools and what you, what you foresee um, back to school in September and what that will look like, recommend schools to do to get ready. Um, that's a, Challenging question. Uh, I, you know, I think for public and even private um, schools, secondary schools, uh, down to elementary school, I'm not sure what um, approach is being taken. Um, but I can say what's happening more at the university, the college level, and there, you know, like most universities want to reopen. Um, they're planning to have a lot more distancing within, house, within classes and, and staggered times of when, when people are, you know, when students are together, uh, you know, for example, they might have a class of 30 people, but only have 15 of them come and 15 do remote one day. And then the next day, the other 15 come and the other 15 do remote to be able to space them out more. It's going to be a lot more uh, mask use, a lot more attention to hand hygiene and cleaning of surfaces, disinfection. And then um, there is going to probably be a lot more testing and, and, and screening for symptoms. Even though you know, the, the, if, if somebody's pre-symptomatic, that may not help. Um, and so it's, it's, it's going to be complicated. A lot of universities are really thinking through different strategies. I don't really know what's happening with, say, public school systems or, or private schools. Um, but I suspect that they're going to be using similar approaches. Okay. Um, the next chat question uh, regarding masks, there are different opinions whether fabric, 
handmade masks are even effective? True or false? So are fabric handmade masks effective? So the, um, this is a complicated question. The, the, the clear, clearly, um, surgical masks are, are more effective than cloth masks, although as we're learning about different materials for cloth masks, sort of a, a you know, higher mesh type material may be more effective at, at sort of picking up um, particles, both large and small, that are, that are in aerosols. And so, so, so cloth mask is definitely not quite as effective as a, say, a surgical mask. Um, but, but it still will suffice a lot of the time um, unless there's a really intensive exposure. I, I, my, I think that we're going to be having a lot more information about what kinds of masks are effective. And, and, and in terms of cloth masks, what kinds of um, sort of fabrics or combinations of materials, like say you have two together, um, that superimpose um, would be more effective. Um, the important thing about masks, though, is that a cloth mask, you know, if you're in an area where there's, there's a lot of coronavirus, the outside of the mask can, be in, can become contaminated. Same is definitely true for a surgical mask. So when taking it off, you need to do it from behind the mask. And then if it's a cloth mask, you know, wash it um, in, in, in you know, hot water and, and, and soap to, to kill any virus. And then wash your hands after touching the mask. Um, the next question, is the timeline for a vaccine more related to the science or the FDA approval? And if the FDA approval, what do you think about whether or not the FDA should alter its criteria? For example, allowing challenge trials. Um. So you know, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I think that it just takes time to go from developing a novel candidate for a vaccine to making sure it's you know, somewhat effective or, or very immunogenic in, in animal models to taking it to humans, testing to make sure it induces a, a protective immune response um, and is safe and doing that in smaller numbers of people, figuring out what the optimal concentration of the vaccine is uh, before moving to much larger phase three trials where you test in hundreds or thousands of people to see both how well it protects against the disease, um, um, more on how good the immune response is, but then also how safe is it. And all that takes time and, and is done usually in close, you know, with input from the FDA um, and input along the way as each phase is done. Um, the FDA, I think, will be fast-tracking approval of vaccines, but they, they don't want to make a mistake and end up with a vaccine that could be either ineffective or unsafe. So, so there, is, you know, there is a need for regulation during this process. And so it, 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 it's, it's a time-consuming process. In terms of challenge trials, I, I don't know that anybody, there are influenza challenge models and common cold challenge models. I'm not sure anybody would want to do that with this virus until we have a really effective treatment because of safety issues. You do a challenge trial and you infect somebody and they become deathly ill and you have no way to treat them, that could be, wouldn't be good. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, next question, um, another mask question. What is the most effective to the least effective? Um, and he's got a bunch of different masks, N95, N95 with a valve, N99, surgical cloth, conical fiber-based workshop type filter. So, so N95 and N95 with valve, I, I've not even heard of an N99. That might be even more intense than N95 based on the numbers um, I, and, and the OSHA sort of categorization. But, but I think those three are, are very, very highly effective, but they're sort of overkill for most situations. Um, they're, they're fit tested, so nothing gets in except what goes through the mask and the mask filters out, you know, sort of almost everything that, that, that could be harmful. Um, and, and so that the, the risk, you know, if you're using those kinds of masks, it really is 
you know, important either for somebody who's like collecting a sample from somebody who might be infected or from for a healthcare worker that's dealing directly with a patient who's infected. So, so I think that, but, but th that said, I mean, N95, N95 with valve and possibly N99 um, are, are the most effective. Surgical is next and surgical, you know, if it sort of covers your whole face and there's very little air leaking in um, is more effective than a cloth uh, mask. Although, as I said, you know, we, we're gonna be learning more about what kinds of cloth um, and sort of innovative approaches to cloth masks can be used. Conical fil fiber based workshop type um, filter, that's probably closer to a surgical mask than a cloth mask, but I, I, I don't know fully. Uh, um, but I suspect it would probably be better than a, just a plain cloth mask. Okay. Um. The governor has suggested that groups greater than 10 should be prohibited, but doesn't indicate in how large of a space. Do you have any recommendations? Uh, that's, that's a challenging question. Um, you know, because of, you know, I think that, that if it's, you know, if there's an attempt to try and, well, I, I, I think that's almost an unanswerable question. I think that, that, um, given what we know about disease transmission, you know, if you had two people together and one of them was infected and they spent half an hour in close quarters, there's a high risk of transmission. So, so 10, you know, these numbers are a bit arbitrary. Um, you know, I think it's really d designated for a place like a bar or a concert or something. And I think, you know, spacing, attention to hand hygiene, use of masks, basically these measures to try and reduce and prevent transmission are going to be very important in those contexts. Um, so that's, that's a good so I'm gonna question go back. and not an easy question. Sorry, I missed Go that. Ahead. No, I said that that was a, a Eileen's oh, question. Okay. Was, it was a good question, but not, not an easy question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These are all difficult questions. Um, so um, back to my email list of questions. Uh, someone wants to know if you have an opinion about when it will be safe to fly, either domestically or internationally, or to go to a major sports event. I mean, I, I think flying right now is probably safe because nobody else is doing it, <laughs> but, um, but at least domestically. Um, internationally, I, there are going to be a lot of travel restrictions for people, first of all, people coming from the United States, going to many other countries. Um, they may request, uh, you know, a 14-day quarantine. Some countries may mandate that you be tested before you arrive there to show that you're not infected or they might do serologic tests, antibody tests to, to sort of show that you've been infected. Again, uh, I'm not sure that's going to be that effective an approach. Um, so, you know, I, I think that travel is going to gradually increase. The airlines are doing an incredible amount of things to try and reduce risk both for the flight attendants and others, you know, other sort of support workers for the airline industries, but also for travelers and, you know, more distancing in the plane, use of masks, you know, cleaning, having uh, sort of uh, the seats and tables and armrests cleaned, um, a lot more attention to sort of personal hygiene, you know, hand, hand cleaning. And all that, I think, is going to make it that it should be pretty low risk to travel, especially if, if one wears a, a, at least a surgical mask. I mean, I, I think you know, cloth mask when you're really close to a lot of people is probably not sufficient. Um, some airlines may be providing masks, but but others may not be. Um, so so I think travel is going to open up. Sports events, ah, you know, this is a tough one. I mean, having large numbers of people. I, I read um, one country is starting to sort of open up and have sports events, but they're going to have maybe 10% of the usual number of people, so they can spread them out in the stadium. That may happen. I, I think. Uh, Major League Soccer is working towards having a shortened season, but trying to open up, but they will not have fans um, in, at their tournaments. And I think that's going to be, unfortunately, we're going to have to watch a lot of 
sporting events on TV, which is definitely not the same as live. Okay. Um, I had a question about uh, when hair salons might open and what those guidelines might look like. Yeah, that's a good question. It's interesting that in some states have already opened hair salons and, and nail parlors and even tattoo parlors. Um, and I think it's challenging. I mean, I, I would think that that the guidelines would be, you know, some degree of distancing, use of masks by both the people working there and then people that are um, having haircuts. Um, although it's a little bit challenging cutting around a mask, <laughs> but um, that may be a new skill for for barbers and and the like. Um, and so, so I and I, I I think that in the early phase of reopening that, that barbers and hair salons are probably not going to be early, but, but they may come in the second round because a lot of people need to have their hair done. Um, uh, but, but uh, it, it's, it's tough because it's, it's a, it's a context where you're really close to another person. Um, and you, you know, if you've got one, say a barber chair after another, or one chair in a salon after another, you may have to have every other one to try and space it out a little bit. But even that, you know, I think with there's going to be need for masks and a lot of, of hygiene for, you know, individuals coming in and then individuals working there and then also cleaning of surfaces, decontamination in case there was somebody infected present. Uh, we have another chat question that came in. Um, asking if this is a one-off event or are we facing um, a future with these kinds of infectious diseases every X number of years? Uh, so this is from Tripp again, and I guess this, this is another good question. The, um, there are various models that have been put forth uh, and some of them um, suggest that we could have cycles every year, every couple of years, so something of the same virus. I, I think part of that relates to whether we can develop an effective vaccine. And, and if we keep having cycles and having to shut down, the, the efforts to make a vaccine are gonna be even more intensified. So, so, it's, so I think there's definitely a risk, but we don't know at this point in time. I mean, if, if you look back at this, the original SARS coronavirus, that just disappeared completely and never came back. I don't think we're gonna be so lucky with this one. I think we will have re sort of recurrences over time, but as we learn how to diagnose it, control it, and, and sort of really suppress or you know, wipe out clusters before they get to be too big, we may not need to sort of go back to a full level of, of basically social shutdown like we are now. But again, it's, it's really hard to predict at this point in time. Um, and then I have uh, one more emailed question um, just about, um, and this sort of goes back to the testing issue um, and how, um, you know, when can we expect enough testing so that employees can feel safe going back to work? Mm -hmm. uh, I, that is uh, another good question. Uh, you know, I think that there's been a lot of effort to scale up testing uh, and partly as an emergency response, but I think that there, there are a number of organizations, you know, hospitals, healthcare centers, uh, state government and, and even universities that are looking at ways to try and develop large scale testing so that, that um, large numbers of people can be tested every week or every month. And so I think testing is going to be much more readily available. I think also that there's going to be a change. My, my hope is that we'll be able to use oral samples, either oral swabs or saliva for testing, and that will really facilitate sample collection. Um, and even potentially you could sort of do, you know, you collect a sample at home and then, and then bring it in or, or, or mail it in. I'll probably bring it in. Um, and, and so different ways of collecting the sample as well as automated high throughput options for testing. And that, that until such time that we have antibody tests that we really trust that, that show 
evidence of immunity that's that's long lasting. You know, I think that we really need to focus on direct testing of the virus and, and strategies to make those more widely available. Great. Um, well, um, we're at the end of our questions. Um, I want to thank you so much for um, giving us so much time and sharing your expertise on this topic. Um, and um, thank you to all of you who, who um, dialed in tonight. Um, I will stick around for a few minutes. So if you want to um, send me any messages through the chat function about how we can improve this type of presentation, um, but I think we can we, we can let Dr. Damer, uh, Dr. Hamer go. Um, he's had a long day doing Zoom calls, I'm sure. So thank you very much. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, take care, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.